Welcome everyone to the HNRCA seminar series. It's my great honor to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Jordan Smaller. It is my firm belief that if had it not been for Dr. Smaller's wisdom and his sheer enthusiasm for collaboration, the HNRCA would not have been competitive for the NIH Clinical Center on Nutrition in Precision Health. Indeed, Dr. Smaller's role as the contact PI for the $60 million, the New England Precision Medicine Consortium of the All of Us Research oh. Program is just one of his many accomplishments. Dr. Smaller completed both his medical and doctoral degrees at Harvard, where he has continued both his clinical practice in psychiatry, primarily at the Mass General Hospital, and his very productive research career now focusing on personalized psychiatry. Dr. Smaller is a very active teacher and mentor at Harvard Medical and Law Schools and at Harvard School of Public Health. He is extremely prolific in terms of his grant funding. He has almost 500 peer review publications and has written three textbooks on topics ranging from psychiatric genetics to epidemiology. I could continue for some time listing Dr. Smaller's impressive accomplishments, but instead I'm going to stop here and I'm going to hand over the virtual podium to Dr. Smaller, who will be discussing precision medicine today and an overview of the All of Us cohort. Dr. Smaller, welcome to the HNRCA seminar. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's, it's really a, a, a pleasure and a privilege to, to be here today and to talk with this group about some of what we're doing and thinking about in precision medicine with a focus on psychiatry, which as you mentioned is the area that I, uh, my own work focuses on. So uh, let me get this started and I assume <clears throat> you'll tell me if you can't see this, uh, but what I wanted to do was to give you a little bit of an overview of how we think about this notion of precision psychiatry in particular as an illustration of the idea of precision medicine and what it may offer. And then also uh, talk a little bit about what's uh, in progress. And, and as uh, Sarah was saying, you know, the foundation of this new, very exciting uh, uh, nutrition precision health initiative, and that is the All of Us Research Program. So I'll touch on that uh, towards the end. My own research, as you'll see, has not uh, focused so much on nutrition, but I think many of the issues that we're addressing have implications that are of relevance to this group. So let me dive in and uh, I'll just start with disclosures and give you a chance to look at that. And let's see, okay. So I'm gonna set the stage by just sort of talking about the scope of mental illness and why this is such an issue that we are concerned about and for which we need better solutions. So neuropsychiatric disorders are the leading cause of disability worldwide, actually. There are nearly a, a trillion dollars in costs associated with mental health and substance use disorders. <clears throat> Many people may not realize that these are disorders that not only carry a lot of morbidity, but mortality. There's about a 10 to 25 fold shorter lifespan on average among people with severe mental illness. And of course, suicide, which is uh, the, the second leading cause of death among young people. We also know that many of the treatments, although they are very helpful for some people, life-saving for, for many, uh, are not really as good as we would hope them to be. And many of them are based on mechanisms that are uh, you know, decades old, frankly. And this is just, you, you don't need to read all of these, but for all, many of the major disorders that we treat, you know, the proportion of people who really respond, can tolerate medications that we have is, uh, is not as good as we would like it to be. And um, there are other gaps that we need to fill that for which we actually have very limited evidence so far or tools available to us. One is sort of how you identify people who are at risk for disorders or for, important outcomes. It's not like cardiology, let's say, where we have really established risk factors that have made their way into the clinic in terms of people making decisions about clinical management. 
we do, you know, our treatments are still largely tie, uh, trial and error. Uh, and, and so, you know, deciding which is the, the treatment that's likely to work best for an individual patient is one that we need a lot more research to, uh, to guide. And then also evidence-based strategies for actually preventing illness and, and enhancing resilience. So these are huge uh, problems that are facing our field. And there's been a lot of talk, of course, and, and I think a lot of excitement about this notion of precision medicine, which is a slightly different way of thinking about how we approach <clears throat> some of these problems than what we've done before. And um, the, the definition that's listed here is from the Precision Medicine Initiative Working Group report that actually led to the All of Us program that we'll talk about later. And the definition was the precision medicine is, is an approach to disease treatment and prevention that seeks to maximize effectiveness by taking into account individual variability in genes and environment and lifestyle. And uh, so it's that emphasis on individual difference actually that in some ways distinguishes what we're talking about here. And as you may know, there are a, a number of tools that are available in this evolving toolkit of precision medicine, everything from molecular assays like you know, DNA sequencing and other omics to research resources, biobanks, electronic health records, which are often on a very large scale, digital and mental health and, and mobile health technologies, uh, newer methods that can handle these kinds of big data sources like machine learning and artificial intelligence, new ways of doing deep phenotyping, and then you know, thinking differently about how we design clinical trials based on stratifying uh, according to some of these meaningful, we hope, individual differences. So um, what I wanna do is run through a couple of use cases of how we are beginning to look at this in the realm of psychiatry. And we'll talk briefly about some work. I'll focus on one example in risk stratification. Another is uh, trying to identify better uh, evidence-based prevention strategies or intervention strategies, and then actually using um, what we're learning from genetics and perhaps other sources to help guide novel treatment development. So let's start with the risk stratification one. And the example I'm gonna give you is from some of the work that we've been doing in the area of suicide, which um, as I mentioned, is a leading cause of death. Uh, and you know, sort of alarmingly, the, the rate of suicide in this country has risen by 30 to 35% over the last couple of decades, although there has been a little bit of a plateau in the last year or so, which hopefully is the sign of, of something uh, changing that, that trajectory. Um, and evidence has shown that clinically, we as clinicians don't really do better than chance at identifying who might really be at risk. And we began to think as, as others have now, uh, a while ago about new ways to approach this. And in particular, this advent of big data and artificial intelligence that might allow us to extract information from very high dimensional data, which in the case I'll describe are electronic health records and help with clinical decision-making by incorporating information beyond what you know, I as an individual clinician could entertain in a given clinical encounter. And in particular, uh, an important thing to realize is that most people who attempt or die by suicide are seen by healthcare providers, uh, well, actually most people in the month leading up to the event, but certainly in the three months leading up to the event. And uh, that means that healthcare settings are actually an important opportunity, an important venue for thinking about identifying people at risk and perhaps uh, developing new prevention strategies. So a, a few years ago now, we began this process of looking, could we identify risk prediction algorithms that do better than what we currently have available? And in this first study, we took the very large healthcare uh, data uh, that are available through the Mass General Brigham system, um, and this is an effort that included 15 years of longitudinal uh, health record data, nearly 9 million person years of data. And we basically built a machine learning algorithm, which is based on what's called a naive Bayes classifier, which is a, 
a, a, a technique that's relatively straightforward, interpretable, and computationally efficient. We trained an algorithm to distinguish people who went on to attempt or die by suicide from those who didn't and developed uh, and validated this model. And what you're looking at on the right side is what we call a, an, a receiver operating curve, which is a, a, a curve of the sensitivity of a, of a test, let's say, uh, on the y-axis against the one minus the specificity, which is also the, the false positive rate. And you know that diagonal dotted line would say you have a test that can't distinguish, let's say, uh, individuals who attempted or died by suicide uh, from those who didn't any better than a coin flip, any better than chance. And what we measure is the area under the curve that you see here that's drawn from the, the sensitivity and the false positive rate. And we achieved an area under the curve of, of 0.77, which is pretty good, actually. And this model detected about 45% of all attempted or completed suicides uh, at 90% specificity on average uh, three years in advance. So that was very encouraging. We then wanted to know, could we uh, see this kind of approach work in other healthcare systems, not just our own? And so we partnered with a network, the ARCH network, uh, and collaborators at, at five other independent healthcare centers, some of them in other parts of the country to say, could we do this elsewhere? Because if we think about actually bringing these things to practice, you'd like to see that it scales and is um, you know, portable in a certain sense. So we took that same approach at these other centers. It was a, several million patients altogether. The bottom line was that on average, the performance was about the same. And uh, that was, again, encouraging. We, um, recently published a paper, this was led by Matt Nock at Harvard University and, uh, and others um, in which we did a prospective comparison uh, of almost 2000 patients who, who presented to the emergency room with psychiatric problems. And then we compared several methods of actually prospectively uh, predicting risk for suicide attempt over the next month or six months. And in particular, we compared the clinician's prediction, how likely do you think it is that this person would make an attempt? Uh, our EIHR algorithm, which I showed you before, and a, a self-report battery uh, completed by the patient at the point of care. And what you see is that the area that, first of all, the clinicians did not do terribly well, which was actually not a surprise because that's been shown before. Um, the other methods all outperformed in terms of this kind of discrimination, the area under the curve. <clears throat> and when you combine the EHR with this brief self-report battery at the point of care, you actually do quite well. And in fact, we then took that and looked at what we would call the positive predictive value. That is, given that somebody is, let's say, in the top 10% of predicted risk, what was the the probability that they actually made a suicide attempt in the next, <clears throat> excuse me, in the next month or the next six months. And it was rather high. These are very high numbers uh, when you think about it. This is saying 40% of people in that top uh, decile actually made an attempt in the next month, uh, six, about 60% over the next six months. So that leads us to believe that we can identify people at least at, at higher risk in a way that makes actually moving towards something like implementation a really feasible thing and a really important thing to do. Uh, another question that comes up when you think about actual implementation and uptake of things like this is, would it be cost effective to do this? And not purely in, in money, I mean, uh, uh, but you know, in terms of thinking about implementation at a healthcare system level. So we also explored that, and this is in a, an analysis led by Eric Ross. This is sort of a detailed economic uh, analysis. And we asked the question, how accurate does a suicide risk algorithm have to be to be cost effective if you implemented it in primary care? And so what we found <clears throat> was that the, the models that have been developed and reported, you can see on the right side, 
uh, <clears throat> this one here, Barack Corin, that was the one that we published initially. There have been others. Um, they are, they appear to be cost effective if you were to implement them and then couple them with either uh, low burden kinds of interventions that are evidence-based, uh, things like active outreach to patients after they leave one of these acute care settings, or even in some cases, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, a more intensive, higher cost intervention. And there are several algorithms that exceed that the positive predictive values that you need to achieve to be cost-effective are not actually that high. And so um, what we're moving towards is trying to actually develop a tool at the point of care, test it and validate it, and, um, and then begin to uh, go from what we call innovation to implementation. So that's an example, I think, of how we can use some of these new approaches or tools or resources that are available to address really important and, and heretofore very difficult problems to solve. Um, we've also built a, a national consortium in collaboration with colleagues at uh, Vanderbilt University and Geisinger Health System and others that we call Psych Emerge, which is a very active collaboration looking at these kinds of EHR-based plus genomic data analyses, and we're, we're looking at all kinds of different uh, areas. I'll mention a couple of things that have emerged from this, but again, using big data to address some of these actually clinically relevant uh, problems. One of the things that we um, uh, have been looking at are what people call polygenic risk scores. As you may know, in, in recent years, there have been very large scale genome-wide association studies of lots of conditions and diseases where basically we are uh, taking people who, let's say, have a, a condition, people who don't, and then actually surveying the genome for variation and asking, are there any regions of the genome that are statistically very strongly associated with that condition? The the value of that clinically is limited by the fact that individual variants, or what we call SNPs, uh, as you may know, single nucleotide polymorphisms, on an individual basis, they're, they're very tiny effects. They might raise the risk of illness you know, less than uh, you know, 5%. And if the base rate of the illness is not that high, uh, that's, that's not very useful. However, if you aggregate them into a score, basically adding up an individual's risk variance across the genome, you get one of these polygenic risk scores, which now actually can capture substantially more variation. And they're, they tend to be normally distributed, as you can see here. Um, and now people are really very interested in saying, can we use this as an index, a kind of aggregate index of genetic risk for you know, a whole variety of things? So in uh, this Psych Emerge network, we actually, uh, our, our first effort was to look at polygenic risk scores for schizophrenia, which have been developed uh, elsewhere. And we were asking the question, if you actually brought this to real world health systems, uh, how would it perform? Would it be able to identify people at risk for schizophrenia? And I won't go into the details here, but I'll just say that we put together data from four different healthcare systems, uh, Partners Healthcare, which is now Mass General Brigham, Vanderbilt University Medical Center, Geisinger Health System, and Mount Sinai School of Medicine. And what we found was that people in the top decile of risk based on this polygenic risk score had about a four and a half fold increased odds of uh, having schizophrenia compared to those at the bottom, or if you took the top decile and just compared it to everybody else, uh, it was about a 2.3 fold increased risk. So that's uh, not nothing, although it's not, uh, it's not a huge, it's sort of not diagnostic, obviously, or, or necessarily prognostic. One thing, though, I will say about it is it's not all that different in effect size from what we see for uh, you know, risk factors that we use in cardiovascular medicine, metabolic medicine uh, for you know, people at risk for heart disease like smoking and so on. But still, we don't think these are clinically actionable at this point. But it shows that you can implement these things and uh, they are picking up the risk that you uh, uh, thought they might be. 
we have also used um, uh, other methods that emerged from this Psych Emerge Consortium, that, which, uh, which I co-lead uh, with, with Leah Davis here at Vanderbilt, uh, pictured here. And her team uh, developed a, another approach called LabWAS, which essentially allows you to take, for example, a genetic marker or polygenic risk score, take the lab data that are available in uh, electronic health records and ask, what is this genetic predictor associated with at the level of measurable labs? And again, without going into all the detail, what you're looking at on the right side was this initial effort to look at this uh, as a proof of concept with cardiovascular related um, uh, disease. Uh, and so it was looking at a cardiovascular polygenic risk score and asking what labs are related to uh, being high in cardiovascular or coronary artery risk. And the answer was uh, sort of reassuringly that the things that we think of as being relevant to cardiovascular disease uh, uh, show up very strongly. So what you're looking at here is uh, a variant of what we sometimes refer to as a Manhattan plot because it, it sometimes has skyscraper appearances. And along the x-axis, you've got all these different kinds of areas of medicine, uh, you know, cancer, cardiovascular, endocrine, and the labs that are associated with them. The y-axis is minus the log of the p-value. So 10 means a p-value of less than 10 to the minus 10th. Very, very strong statistical association. And what you can see, and here's, here's uh, something like 10 to the minus fourth, uh, all of these well-known um, you know, biological correlates of cardiovascular disease are strongly associated with the polygenic risk score for cardiovascular disease. So we wanted to see also whether, um, and we replicated this by the way, this was in the Vanderbilt Biobank, we replicated it in the, the Mass General Brigham Biobank, and then wanted to see, could we apply this to uh, conditions relevant to psychiatry where we really don't have biomarkers uh, for the most part. Uh, and in particular depression, um, there have been some biological correlates uh, and, and ideas about biological indices that may be related to depression risk, including inflammatory uh, kinds of compounds, uh, cytokines, and so on. When we did the lab loss across now four healthcare systems in the Psych Emerge network using this depression polygenic risk score instead of MDD stands for major depressive disorder, instead of cardiovascular disease, you see that one, actually interestingly, a few of the cardiovascular related um, labs come up, but the one that's screamingly positive here is white blood cell count, which is interesting and maybe surprising. Um, we see it across, this is a forest plot, looking at the, um, the effect size for depression, polygenic risk score, um, this is if you control for people who had depression or who had depression and anxiety, it's pretty robust. And so we're now following this up, but it's just sort of an illustration of how you might use these kinds of data sources to identify perhaps novel biomarkers. The next thing that we, uh, I'll, I'll move quickly on to is identifying again, whether somebody might be more likely to respond to one treatment or another. As I mentioned right now, most of this is trial and error. And um, what that means is that despite the fact that many people in this country are prescribed psychotropic drugs, antidepressants, it's very difficult to know uh, prior to treatment whether somebody is likely to respond or likely to have a, um, you know, a, 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 an adverse reaction that's, that's significant. Um, we, we've looked at this at the genetic level to some degree, but we've also more recently begun to again, apply artificial intelligence and big data to see if we can make some progress on this. And this was uh, work led by Yihan Xu, who is uh, now a junior faculty member in our unit. Um, and essentially what he did was identify more than 17,000 patients who had started an antidepressant from one of the classes of medicine that we think of as kind of first line 
uh, opportunities. SSRIs, SNRIs like venlafaxine or Effexor, bupropion, mirtazapine, looked at their response after starting the antidepressant and then applied a series of machine learning models to see could we develop predictors that would uh, allow us to know ahead of time whether somebody was more likely to respond to one or another of these. And again, the results I, I think have been promising. Uh, in part, it's interesting because we get a differential prediction. That is, we see that this person might be more likely to respond to, let's say an SSRI and less likely an SNRI. Um, and even though the distinctions may not be huge, any sort of edge we get in clinical practice can mean a lot to patients because otherwise we're waiting uh, weeks to really know the answer. If we have a little bit of a head start on that, uh, that might really be helpful. The other thing I wanted to mention uh, is the notion of identifying promising prevention strategies. Uh, and I think this will be of interest to some of you who are thinking about uh, you know, diet, physical activity, and so on as uh, things that may be modifiable and of relevance to lots of healthcare outcomes. What we know uh, about preventing psychiatric disorders is still pretty limited. We know you should probably uh, not have affected first degree relatives because it's partly familial. You should try to avoid significant childhood adversity and uh, don't use drugs. Uh, as you know, or can see, obviously, these are not hugely easy to modify. Some of them are impossible to modify. In the case of depression, there are two widely discussed and potentially modifiable factors that people have implicated as being protective. Uh, one of them is physical activity, and the other is social support. And so we began a series of studies um, led by Carmel Choi, who is again now a junior faculty member in our center. Uh, and what Carmel did was actually ask, um, is there a causal relationship between physical activity and reduced risk of depression? And the way she approached this was to use a technique that is relatively recent called Mendelian randomization, which is kind of like um, emulating to some degree a, a clinical trial by using the fact that genetic variants are transmitted in a, a sort of random way uh, from parents to offspring. And depending on the variants that you have, you could be at uh, genetically higher or lower risk of a given exposure. So what we're actually looking at here, you can see this causal diagram on the right side is, we wanna estimate the causal effect of an exposure on an outcome. So this is this B2, beta two, is the effect estimate that we're trying to get. And uh, the, the way we calculate this is by looking at uh, genetic information that affects um, the, the outcome of interest. And we're at, I'm sorry, that affects the exposure of interest. And we're looking at its effect on the outcome of interest and the ratio of effects give us, gives us this um, effect that we're interested in. So she actually used data from the uh, UK Biobank, which is a very large scale study of a half million uh, individuals in the UK. And there were, um, in addition to self-reported measures of physical activity, there were accelerometer-based measurements in about 90,000 or so. And so we could set up this analysis and ask that question. And in fact, what happened was uh, it did appear to be, uh, uh, to have a, an apparent causal effect. The odds ratio was uh, 0.74, that is about a 26% reduction per standard uh, uh, deviation increase in, at, in average acceleration. And you know, sort of calculating this back uh, to get that level of uh, protection, you could replace 15 minutes of sitting with 15 minutes of running or uh, an hour of sitting with an hour of moderate activity. We um, followed this up in our own biobank by again, looking at polygenic risk scores now. And what we found, first of all, was in our biobank, and we had a sample of about 8,000 people, and we asked, you know, again, do we see this uh, relation and physical activity? 
This is actually based on self-report rather than accelerometers, but you still see this effect where uh, as physical activity quintiles increase, uh, incident depression, the risk of developing a, a new episode of depression decreases. And when you stratify people by polygenic risk score, by their overall kind of genetic loading for depression, you see an, a, a protective effect of physical activity uh, on risk of developing depression across all levels of genetic risk, which is actually pretty uh, comforting and uh, certainly in favor of thinking about physical activity as a preventive intervention. The other uh, area that we've been studying in this way is social support. And uh, this began with a study that we did in a program called Army Stars, where we uh, uh, had data from soldiers who had deployed to uh, combat in Afghanistan uh, and who were enrolled in the, in the study and studied before and after deployment. And we could look at who developed depression after returning from, uh, from combat exposure. And the variable that we were particularly interested in here was genetic risk and also a measure of social support. What we found was that um, if you look at new onset depression, the higher your genetic risk score for depression, the more likely you were to develop depression in the months uh, following return. But there was this protective effect of uh, what we, what's called unit cohesion. Unit cohesion is kind of a measure of social cohesion uh, that's uh, uh, in the military, for example, how, how much do your um, colleagues, your, your superior officers have your back? How, how, how cohesive is the group that you're part of? And um, what we found further was that despite levels of genetic risk, whether it was low, medium, or high, and even despite levels of deployment stress, combat exposure stress, this protective effect of uh, this sort of social cohesion was evident across the board. And as a final example, we went back to the uh, UK Biobank and did a, a broader scan. We, we identified 105 modifiable lifestyle, dietary, and behavioral factors that were measured in this sample. We looked at people uh, uh, who were, you know, who had those things measured, and we looked at who developed depression over the next five years or so. And uh, we asked, what of these modifiable factors were associated with a reduced risk of developing depression? We also did analyses stratifying by genetic risk and by trauma exposure. And again, uh, in the interest of time, we'll go a little bit quickly, but uh, what we found is on the left here. So if you scan all these things, and you'll, you'll remember the design of this plot, a minus log p-value here, uh, and these are different uh, groupings of modifiable factors, physical, uh, circadian, media exposure, social, environmental, dietary, et cetera. This, this red line here is the uh, multiple testing corrected p-value threshold. And so there were a number of things that were associated with reduced risk. The one that, again, stands out just above and beyond all others was frequency of confiding in others. The p-value here is almost 10 to the minus 100. Um, now, as you can imagine, this could be confounded by factors that are associated with one or the other of these things, because this is sort of looking at incident depression, all of these variables at an association level. So we took the ones that seem to stand out as significant and again, applied this Mendelian randomization to say, where is there perhaps a causal effect? And what we found was that on the protective side, again, frequency of confiding in others was uh, still there tea intake, interestingly, and this is a group that maybe could help us interpret that, as with another one that was a little puzzling, which was the risk increasing effect of multivitamins, for which there actually is a little bit of prior literature, but I can't tell you why that would be. Uh, other social support uh, measures, frequency of family and friends visiting, exercise, we had already shown the, the physical ac activity by accelerometer, so again, exercise and social support seem to come to the fore.
The last sort of use case I wanted to give you was using genomics and, uh, and basically the biology of individual differences to guide the development of new therapies. Uh, there's been a literature that's shown that selecting drug targets to develop that are based on uh, genetic findings can double the probability that you will go from a, a phase one to approval. Uh, and so, you know, by grounding it in human biology, there is this potential advantage. And in the case that I'm gonna show you, this is work um, uh, led by Robbie Mueller uh, in our group. Um, we began with a confirmed genetic association. This is sort of a more general pipeline, um, but the notion is you then can try to biologically characterize uh, that in, in model systems, for example. Uh, you can develop cell-based assays, potentially screen small molecules, develop lead compounds, et cetera. Then you're back in the usual framework. But you're, what you're trying to do here is go from a known human biological association. So in the case that we're uh, talking about today, this was uh, schizophrenia. Uh, so you're looking at one of these Manhattan plots on the right. And again, this is, in this case, what you're looking at is uh, all of the SNPs that were tested, the millions of SNPs uh, along the chromosomes here. And this is again, the, the p-value, the minus the log p-value, this red line, if you could see it as statistical significance. This uh, thing that I've highlighted here is a variant that is in the exon of a gene and that um, is a missense mutation. And that's unusual to find in a, uh, in a GWAS. Mostly you're finding things whose whose function you don't necessarily know. And this turns out to be a pretty strongly associated variant. Um, and it's in a gene uh, called SLC 39A8, which is a manganese transporter that is, uh, and this variant is actually relatively common for something that you pick up in a, in a GWAS. And the reason that that is in part of interest is that manganese as, as people here probably know, is a cofactor for a lot of glycosylation-related enzymes. And glycosylation is a biochemical process that's relevant to the function of all kinds of cellular systems, adding sugars to, you know, to proteins and lipids. But uh, of particular interest to us, uh, brain development, cellular signaling and adhesion and, and brain development. And uh, there had been descriptions of congenital disorders of glycosylation, um, and including two severe loss of function mutations in this gene. And the, the patients presented with severe uh, growth abnormalities and brain uh, related abnormalities, which you can see on the scans on the left. They also had undetectable manganese levels and impairments of glycosylation of, uh, of transferring, for example, which is the most common um, and what was striking was if you gave galactose, which is an intermediate in, um, in some of these glycosylation uh, pathways, uh, or potentially manganese, the biochemical um, uh, dysfunction that you see in their glycosylation was reversible. And so galactose, in this case, being administered, you get a return of species of glycoproteins that are more complex, take away the galactose, it falls, bring it back, it rises again. So Robbie uh, led a study in our own biobank again, where we identified um, patients who carried variants of this uh, uh, mutation in, in this manganese transporter and did some fairly complex and uh, you know, comprehensive uh, biochemical assays. One thing uh, he was able to show was that uh, people who carry the risk allele for schizophrenia had uh, a significant reduction in serum manganese, but not other cations for, for the most part. Um, also that the people carrying the risk allele had reduced branching of plasma L and uh, glycans, I'm just looking at how we're doing on time. Um, so in other words, there were more uh, sort of early intermediates in these glycosylation pathways and fewer of the 
more uh, end product or, or more highly branched uh, end glycans. So the notion is that in the absence of sufficient manganese, as you go uh, along the, this biochemical pathway of adding and modifying glycan structures or gly, uh, you know, um, glycosylation structures, uh, you, you don't have the opportunity to get to the full degree of uh, complexity and branching that you wouldn't otherwise see. Uh, he followed that up with a mouse knock-in of this human variant uh, and found that this same variation alters the abundance of uh, N-glycans in the brain in a region-dependent kind of manner uh, in, in the mouse. And there, there's pretty widespread uh, alteration of N-glycans uh, in uh, the mouse brain. Um, and many of the N-glycoproteins um, that have been, whose genes have been linked to schizophrenia have uh, altered, um, uh, have altered uh, levels essentially in this mouse model. Uh, so, uh, you know, Robbie has proposed this hypothesis of novel biology of, of an important pathway that's uh, we think been overlooked and that is uh, glycobiology, uh, you know, that many of the, the the, the genes that are implicated in these genome-wide studies turn out uh, in schizophrenia to be related to glycosylation enzymes or cofactors um, and you know, might be contributing to some of the known synaptic and other brain developmental difficulties in the disorder. So more to, to come on that, but uh, another encouraging piece of it was that when he profiled the, um, the the end glycan branching of patients with this severe loss of function mutation, um, you see, uh, you know, the, the deficit that I mentioned before in uh, complexity. Um, but oral uh, supplementation uh, reversed this again. So we're actually, you know, hopeful that we might now move to some kind of proof of concept trial. Um, and again, the the main issue here is is one of using individual differences data, in this case, genomic variation, to get us to something better than we've had before, or at least a new option um, based on this kind of precision medicine approach. So um, we're starting to see this, there's a long way to go, uh, but we are, I think now at a point where we can make use of some of these tools that I mentioned up front to start a, to drive the field in, uh, in some new directions that might actually be useful in all areas of, of prevention and, and diagnosis and treatment and so on. A lot, lot more work to be done. But I do wanna mention this effort that is on the horizon, not just for us uh, in the field of precision psychiatry, but for everyone, everyone here and everyone um, more broadly speaking, and that is the All of Us Research Program. So, uh, I wanna just give you kind of a very brief overview of what it is. It's a very unique um, uh, study. It, it is you know, the largest study of its kind, uh, a million or more people being enrolled uh, and a real commitment to diversity and representation in the study cohort. So it is a, a longitudinal cohort um, that began enrolling uh, officially in uh, the spring of 2018. And the goal is to ensure in part that as we collect the data and build the resources necessary to fuel precision medicine in the future, we make sure that everybody is able to benefit. As, as you undoubtedly know, historically, many groups have been underrepresented in biomedical research. Uh, and this study in part uh, is going to, we hope, uh, make a real difference in changing that. There is a lot of data collected of various types that people who enroll in the program um, uh, you know, provide. There is a focus on participants as partners. And in fact, participants and groups uh, and communities have been at the table in the design of the study and every part of it since. And it is creating a resource for researchers uh, that will uh, really, I think, be unprecedented in terms of the scale and the scope. And um, I'll, I'll mention how you can begin to look at this already if you're interested at a data level. Um, 
basically, uh, you know, this is a schematic of how the program works. Participants share their data. Uh, the data are uh, received and uh, um, enter a, a cloud-based, highly secure uh, research resource. Um, and then researchers can register and apply for access to that. And um, there is a, a, a remarkable uh, suite of tools and uh, IT uh, infrastructure that's available to facilitate research with this cohort, because it's not intended purely for the academic community. It's really intended to be a broad resource uh, for, um, for everybody. Uh, the, the data that are collected include things like uh, surveys uh, over time, electronic health records, physical measurements, wearables, uh, genomics, other biosamples, and potentially others in, in the future. And as of uh, this month, um, about 470,000 folks have uh, enrolled in the study. Uh, the map you're seeing there is colored by the, the number of participants in different regions of the country. And uh, as, um, as hoped, um, the, the diversity of the cohort is, is really, I, I think, um, at this scale, sort of unprecedented. So more than half are from racial and ethnic minorities. More than 80% are from groups that have been historically underrepresented in biomedical research, including racial and ethnic minorities, but also sexual and gender minorities, disabled individuals, uh, people living in rural areas, uh, lower income folks, and so on. Uh, and there are sites around the country uh, now uh, enrolling and collecting uh, data. And one of them is our own All of Us New England program, which is a collaboration of Mass General Brigham and its hospitals and health centers with Boston Medical Center and its health centers as well. And we, are, uh, we have already enrolled about 30,000 uh, participants at our site on our way to about 90,000 overall. And we are uh, you know, around the Boston area in many different sites and, and uh, trying to represent the diversity of our own region. Um, uh, as you can see. The data that uh, are generated from the All of Us program, as I mentioned, are available. If you go to the, the website, uh, researchallofus.org, that's listed there, you can go there now and you can query uh, and look at data at a public tier level right now with no you know, special approvals or paperwork or anything that gives you a sense in, in aggregate of, of what kinds of data are available, um, some of the de demographic distribution of the data, uh, what were the measures used. And then it can also connect you to uh, the re what we call the registered tier and the controlled tier, which um, should be available soon, which allows um, researchers with appropriate approvals to access um, the actual individual level data in a very secure cloud environment. The data never leave that secure enclave. Um, but uh, again, that's the, the full scope of data that are available. Super exciting is the fact that um, uh, the first ancillary study of the All of Us program was just announced and launched. And uh, the folks here at Tufts are, uh, along with, with you know, collaborators throughout our All of Us New England program and at Mass General leading the All of Us New England Research Collaborative. Um, this is a huge new effort uh, sponsored by the NIH to look at um, individual differences in response to dietary factors across multiple levels of biology, to use artificial intelligence to develop algorithms that might predict uh, individual responses to foods and dietary patterns, and then hopefully to validate those and bring them to clinical care. And finally, bring some of these real evidence-based algorithms uh, to help shape individual uh, recommendations for patients. And there are several modules or components of the program, uh, some looking at uh, habitual intake of uh, you know, what people are eating and its effect on these various parameters, free living, feeding, and testing um, you know, different uh, diets among people 
in the community uh, and comparing those in a, in a more structured way. And then actually domiciled feeding um, as, you know, as you do in, uh, at the center at Tufts uh, and that will be done at other centers. So this is a, a super exciting uh, advance and a, a wonderful opportunity to be collaborating with, with, with uh, Sarah and, and others uh, there. Um, I'm just showing some acknowledgements because I want to give us some time uh, at the end for questions. These are some of the folks who worked on the, uh, the suicide risk prediction work that I showed you, the Psych Emerge Network. And um, in the All of Us program, uh, my uh, co-principal investigators, um, Beth Carlson, Sean Murphy, Cheryl Clark, and George O'Connor, and a, a remarkable team of co-investigators across our systems, um, as you can see here, and, uh, and our staff, our program managers who really uh, have really driven uh, this work and done just an absolutely superb job. So I am going to stop there because I think we do have time for a few questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Smoller for an excellent presentation. Uh, I'll kick off some of the questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Stefania Lamont Fava has asked, Jordan, thank you for your very interesting talk. You have shown the predicting effect of exercise or physical activity on MDD. Do you know if in the same population, I guess this is the UK Biobank, specific mm. dietary patterns are also predictive of depression? Thanks for the question. Good to see you, Stefania. Um, uh, the hint that we got in that study was of these couple of things that survived this kind of causal analysis. Uh, and as I mentioned, I don't know what to make it. You know, it's, we, we looked at a variety of things that the UK Biobank actually has pretty detailed dietary assessment measures. Um, and some of them showed up as initial associations, but didn't survive that second level of kind of screening. The ones that did were the, um, again, the risk enhancing effect of multivitamin use and the protective effect of uh, tea intake. Uh, neither of those were on our list as things we you know, would have uh, thought about um, as being particularly related to later depression. Uh, but a lot of other things so far didn't. Excellent. Uh, Shannon Casperson asks, what level of manganese supplementation I think we, did you have in that study? She mentions that, or he mentions, I'm not sure. There are foods rich in manganese, sweet potato, chickpeas, spinach, to name a few. Can changes in diet be used as opposed to supplementation? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, this is one of the things that you know we, we're thinking about as we think about how would you actually bring this uh, to, uh, to a trial, for example, um, you know, while manganese is relatively uh, safe, you can, you know, very high levels uh, can be concentrated uh, and uh, can cause problems, hyper uh, magnesium, you know, hyper, you know, manganese emia. Um, uh, and so it's not totally clear. Uh, it, it does look like um, ranges in the, you know, up to the upper level uh, of um, supplementation that, that is, you know, that people often do might be helpful, but we actually have to sort of figure that out. And we haven't sort of mapped out a dose finding study. Whether you could achieve that uh, in, um, uh, in, you know, d by dietary modification, perhaps it'd be interesting. Um, and maybe we could follow up somehow to sort of pick, pick your brain about that. Great. Uh, uh, Dr. Larry Parnell asks, um, this is about the polygenic risk scores. Uh, many in the genetics and genomics communities are coming to realize that polygenic risk scores can have limited utility when developed in one population of a certain genetic ancestry and applied to a cohort of a different ancestry. Uh, thus, what were the ancestries of the populations used to derive the PRS? What do you think of the need to develop population-specific PRSs? Yeah, that's a great question, and you're absolutely right. 
uh, that uh, polygenic risk scores that are developed in one ancestry, essentially, people of one ancestral background, may not work very well at all in some cases in people of other ancestral backgrounds. And in the case of the ones that I showed you, they were, they were restricted to European ancestry populations. We controlled for um, other principal components of ancestry, but uh, we know from other studies that the European ancestry polygenic risk scores don't uh, do as well in other ancestries. The reason we focused on that was simply uh, that that's what has been studied to date in the literature and are available for the largest samples. That is changing. And there is, in fact, as you say, a big emphasis on incorporating that diversity into polygenic risk scores, perhaps not necessarily by population specific polygenic risk scores, but newer methods that allow you to develop uh, trans ethnic polygenic risk scores that allow you to potentially apply them across ancestries to some degree by incorporating training data from multiple ancestries. Great. Uh, Dr. Zhang Dong Wang asks, during COVID-19 pandemic, there has been concern that social isolation, depression, financial stress, limited access to healthcare services may contribute to an increase in suicidal behaviors. Using your approaches and program, can you investigate the genetic risk and modifiable risk factors? For example, poor nutrition status as early identification of predictors of suicidal behavior due to the pandemic. In principle, it? absolutely. Um, whether you would find uh, an effect uh, stratified by, by genetic risk is obviously an open question. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right that many of the things about the pandemic, of course, directly impact uh, risk factors for depression, non-genetic risk factors, uh, the various social determinants of health, social isolation in particular. We just did a study in the All of Us cohort led by a postdoc, Heather Lee, in our lab, looking at the effect of everyday discrimination early in the pandemic on risk for depressive symptoms and suicidal uh, ideation and finding that uh, higher degrees of everyday discrimination were in fact associated with higher levels of uh, depressive symptoms, suicidal ideation. And in particular, when the, the discrimination was, uh, appeared to be based on race or ethnicity um, uh, for, for uh, Asian participants or Asian Americans and black uh, or African-American participants, uh, that effect was particularly marked early in the, in the pandemic. So these kinds of social factors play a huge role. You could stratify absolutely in principle by genetics to see if you might uh, see whether those have a more potent effect in various uh, groups. I guess, um, I guess maybe we have time for one more question. Um, and I think there was a lot of interest in the data from the UK Biobank study and I think this is, a, this is a good one for association studies in general. Uh, so this is from Kelly Cara. In the UK Biobank studies on depression outcomes, you referred to factors like TV watching, social support, and physical activity as being causative. I'm not sure if you said that, but, but can you briefly explain again how you accounted for reverse causation? Uh, individuals with depression being more likely to watch more TV, interact less with others, and be less physically active. Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. TV actually, TV use was a risk factor, not protective. Um, but uh, the two things that we did, the first level was we looked at incident depression. So you measure these things at baseline and among people who don't have depression and you look at who develops depression. The second thing was taking that, a second step was the Mendelian randomization to say, is there evidence that uh, uh, genetic risk, uh, essentially genetic risk for more TV watching uh, is associated with uh, more depression. And if you apply the Mendelian randomization framework, you can get this um, estimate, which uh, goes a ways towards uh, isolating a causal, a potential causal relationship um, rather than a reverse causation. We actually did look uh, we actually did do in the physical activity one, for example, a, what we call a bi-directional uh, Mendelian randomization. So that means that, in fact, we did that in, in, in this UK biobank one more generally. 
So for example, there, we did not see evidence for a causal effect of depression uh, on physical activity in the Mendelian randomization. Um, not that it couldn't exist, but it wasn't apparent in the data. Um, and, uh, you know, so the effect that we saw was in the direction of the exposure leading to depression. There's always potential for residual confounding in any method basically you use. And then do you know how the supplements were queried like in UK Biobank? Uh, was it just use of any dietary supplement or specific sure vitamin and mineral supplements? Or... Item. One thing you could do is if you go to their website, you should be able to pull up the specific items, but I don't remember off the top of my head. Great. Okay, I think we are being respectful of your time, Dr. Smaller. We are just a little past the hour. And again, on behalf of the HNRCA and the community here at Tufts, we really want to thank you for an excellent presentation and discussion of your work. Thank you very much. Thank you so and much. And thank you, everybody, for attending the seminar today. Bye, everyone. Thank you.